Really appreciate your interest in, in signing up and participating today. We had over 100 registrations, majority of whom are from the food system. So we appreciate our food system colleagues signing in and dialing up, uh, participating today. And we'll ask David Fikes from FMI to have a few comments at the end of our presentation today, uh, just to express uh, his thoughts on the framework and, and the value of it to the food system. So our agenda today, fairly straightforward. We're going to have a quick overview of the Responsible Gene Editing and Agriculture Coalition, provide a little more insight on who it is, what it's, why it exists, and what we're trying to accomplish. A specific overview of the framework for the responsible use of gene editing and agriculture. This is a framework that's been three years in developing and has included a very diverse group of stakeholders by design. So we have a lot of perspectives reflected in the framework. Uh, how to get involved, if you are interested in having your organization uh, be verified as uh, participating in the framework for uh, responsible use, you can do that, or you can certainly engage with others who are working on it as well. And then some additional resources we have available to help build trust in gene editing technology. The webinar is also being recorded. So if you have colleagues or others that aren't able to attend today and you would like to be able to share it with them, uh, we'll share that in a follow-up link. Also at the end of today's webinar, there will be a link to a survey uh, to get your feedback and also your interest in participation. Uh, so that will be in the chat box at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation. So you'll have an opportunity to uh, provide some feedback as well as to provide some, uh, your expression of interest if you're interested in learning more about how to participate. So let, let's start by just creating the foundation about the coalition. How did we get to where we are today? Uh, what are we about? What's the vision? What's the mission of the organization? And the, the, the vision is pretty straightforward. Global acceptance and support for the responsible use of gene editing technology in agriculture and food. Uh, those who participate in the coalition see tremendous potential for this technology to make a significant difference and positive impact on a number of challenges uh, that we face in food and agriculture, from climate change to nutrition to food affordability to availability, uh, reducing animal suffering, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, and gene editing, like other technology, has the potential to provide some wonderful solutions for, for those challenges. The mission then is to cultivate support for the responsible use of gene editing in agriculture through the development and adoption of trustworthy guidelines for the responsible use of gene editing, effective stakeholder outreach and engagement, and broad-based involvement and collaboration of those involved in gene editing. So that's the mission of the organization, and we've been on this journey for the last three plus years to develop the framework for responsible use of gene editing in agriculture. Now, the goal of the coalition and the framework is to create, uh, provide a framework for the responsible use that provides assurance to the food system and other stakeholders that those using gene editing within the framework are worthy of trust. It is not a direct-to-consumer effort, but it is really designed to provide our food system stakeholders the assurance that this technology is something they can be comfortable incorporating into their supply chain, uh, that it has tremendous benefits to society, and that it is being used responsibly in following the, the framework. The framework was also developed to be credible, workable, and affordable. And it might have been faster to simply do an industry-based approach where we only had um, uh, industry involved in establishing the framework, but we chose to have a very diverse group of stakeholders that you'll see on a subsequent slide because it was important for us for the framework to be viewed as credible by a variety of stakeholders. So as you can imagine, uh, the perspective on what constitutes credibility, workability, and affordability might vary uh, depending upon where you are in the system and the perspective you have on, on the proposed uh, framework as, as it was being developed. So as I noted, the current framework was three years in the making, and it was really initiated as a result of a food system meeting that we had in March of 2018 in perhaps the most crowded hotel room ever uh, in Arlington, Virginia. We had a majority of food retail uh, being sold, represented in the room, a very significant percentage of CPG, as well as developers and their related associations, all part of that meeting. And the initial draft of the framework was done primarily by those in industry. And the feedback at the summit was, this is a great start, but it's not sufficient. If you want food system support, you're going to have to include some other attributes like verification, uh, like social considerations, and some of the other attributes that have been incorporated. And you really need to have a very diverse group of stakeholders involved in the development. Uh, that just having those in industry involved in the development doesn't create the credibility that other stakeholders are looking for. So we took that feedback and we developed the process, the flowchart you see there on the screen. It began by establishing a very diverse steering committee. And we are indebted 
uh, seriously indebted to all of those individuals and organizations that chose to spend uh, the th three years working on the framework. They uh, made a tremendous commitment and invested a significant amount of time and energy in putting that together. We then began to identify other models that achieve similar outcomes. So a market-based assurance program, the concept of a market-based assurance program is not new. There are many of them, whether they're from food safety or animal welfare or other attributes. So we looked at the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, the USDA Organic Standards, uh, some other programs, nutritional, assurance, nutritional supplement assurance program and others to identify some common principles that could serve as the foundation as the framework was developed. So we identified those principles, shared them then with the uh, steering committee that worked on developing the framework. And that took the better part of two years uh, to really put the framework together and to work through all of the different commitments uh, to, to make sure the principles were being reflected uh, and to incorporate the diverse perspectives of all of those individuals and organizations who were part of the process. We then gathered stakeholder input, and we'll talk about that process as well. And then in December of 2020, the coalition leadership team uh, approved the framework. And over 2021, we worked on the verification documents and uh, securing support from a number of organizations to endorse the framework uh, as it is launched. And today is the formal launch. So the launch is really the coming out party. It's the opportunity for a broader group of stakeholders to understand what we're doing, to be fully expo formally exposed to the framework, to be able to download it and begin to consider uh, whether this is something that is relevant for, for their individual organization. So you can see the, the different entities that were involved on the steering committee and the different sectors they represent. So great representation from civil society, tech developers, academia, academics, uh, associations, food companies, and farmers, and uh, lots of different perspectives. Uh, Kevin Fitzgerald from Creighton University is a bioethicist. So uh, Mike Postian from Postian Enterprises, the, one of the farmers who was involved has his PhD in microbiology. So some really interesting perspectives that people brought to the table in representing their sector and their sector's interests as part of the conversation as the framework was being developed. We then set about after the framework was developed and the initial draft was approved by the Coalition uh, Oversight Committee. We then communicated with more than 450 different stakeholders, 140 representatives of more than 70 grower related associations were invited to participate in the feedback process. We had 18 webinars attended by more than 250 people. And based on that feedback, we put together specific working groups to deal with the issues you see there on the screen, definition, international trade, regulatory, IP protection, how we talk about off targets, social considerations and the verification process. So the international trade section was added based on the feedback but others were simply modified. For example, on definition, um, because there is already a very robust regulatory system for transgenic applications, the original definition tried to carve out transgenic applications because those are already addressed through regulation. It was very cumbersome and confusing. And the feedback we had from people both with technical orientation and non-technical orientation was, I don't understand the definition. So we simplified it. And we simply talked about the definition of gene editing and the fact that uh, the, the, the framework was developed with non-transgenic applications in mind. But we clarified that. So we did the same process across that and we brought individuals and stakeholders together who had specific expertise or specific interest in that particular uh, working group to be able to help us develop um, a revised framework that could then be moved forward. Based on that input, the framework was then revised and approved by coalition leadership in December of 2020, and organizations that submitted feedback were sent the revised framework and offered a follow-up meeting in April of 2021, and we've had ongoing conversations with a variety of stakeholders since that time as we move toward and now launching the, the framework. So there are seven basic principles, <clears throat> excuse me, that are included in the framework. Uh, and again, many of these came from other voluntary governance models, uh, but there are a couple I think that are novel to this framework. Uh, transparency, continuous improvement, safety and quality, verification, trade and market considerations, stakeholder engagement, and social considerations are the seven different principles. Now, I believe five of those, transparency, continuous improvement, safety, quality, verification, stakeholder engagement, are common among many other programs. What we think is unique to this one, and we may not have the entire picture, so if we're, if we're wrong on that, let us know, 
uh, trade and market considerations and social considerations. Uh, social considerations is something that we know from our food system stakeholders as part of the process was absolutely essential. That many of the questions that, that food companies and retailers receive about the technology really don't have anything to do with the technical merits of the technology or the technical attributes of the technology or the safety of the technology, but what are the potential social considerations? And so it was important to integrate that into the framework in an effort to be able to raise that so that social considerations are part of and included in the principles uh, that are part of the framework. Then in order to bring the principles to life, each principle now has commitments and guidance that provide objective evidence that an organization is operating in conformance with the framework. Now the commitments are very specific, but as you see on the right hand side of the screen, uh, you'll see there are four different uh, stages of gene editing development, and not every commitment applies to each. Uh, some commitments only apply to commercial research, others apply to commercial development, then commercialization, then commercial life cycle. So it became very clear as we were developing the framework uh, that both academics and developers said, doesn't make sense for some of these to apply if we're only in commercial research. If we haven't taken the next step of moving to commercial development or commercial introduction, it just doesn't make sense to have a stakeholder engagement plan or some of the other efforts because we're simply not at that part, we're not at that stage in our development. So as you go through the framework, you'll begin to see how specific uh, commitments apply to various stages of the life cycle of, of gene editing based on what's relevant in that life cycle. It's also crucially important to understand that guidance is just guidance. It is not prescriptive. So there are many ways that you may be able to demonstrate that you are meeting the commitment without necessarily following the guidance. The guidance is an illustration of what you can do or you might be able to do to be able to demonstrate you're living up to the commitment, but it is not prescriptive. There may be many other ways that you can demonstrate that you're living up to the commitment uh, that aren't included in the current guidance. And organizations must meet 75% of the applicable commitments to achieve verification. Uh, we understand that perfection is not a realistic goal, but we wanted to make sure that 75% of the applicable commitments are met as a way to demonstrate, again, that the framework is going to be credible. Uh, and then there'll be opportunities for improvement if there are 25% of the commitments that aren't made, uh, that aren't met yet, they might be able to be met over time. So how can you get involved uh, if you are an organization? Uh, there are several different ways. You can fund the organization and help provide that support that allows us to continue to operate for $25,000 a year. You get a seat on the Coalition Operations Committee. You can be a supporter simply because you think the effort is important, or you can be a framework participant. Now, I want to spend just a minute or two talking about why the framework participant uh, commitment is at the level that it, that it is today. Um, as we were having conversations with the steering committee, it became very clear there was a concern about pricing the framework out of reach for startups and for smaller organizations or perhaps for an academic lab that was interested perhaps in participating in the framework. So in many organizations and in many uh, kind of market-driven um, assurance programs, both the fixed cost and the variable cost have to be covered by those participants, which means you take your overall cost, you divide it by the, the total number of participants you anticipate in every year, and whoever's participating has to cover that cost. In order to make this more available, the, the committees that were involved here said, we wanna cover the fixed cost through our ongoing funding and have those who participate only cover variable costs. And so we've worked to make it very affordable for organizations to participate by having $1,000 a year plus the variable verification fees that will range between 500 and 2000, depending on the size of an organization, every three years. So the, the leadership group was intent on making sure that whoever participates has some skin in the game, $1,000 a year, but it is still very affordable for those involved in gene editing at whatever size of the organization you may happen to be. We're very pleased uh, as we begin now to formally launch and publicly talk about the framework uh, that we have uh, identified six organizations that have uh, publicly endorsed the framework, and uh, it's Cargill, Costco, FMI, the Food Industry Association, Genus, which is in the livestock genetic business, PepsiCo, and Tropic Bioscience. And so you can see a variety of interest, whether it's food companies or retailers or international uh, companies that are involved in all kinds of food activities or developers, whether they be from plants or animals. Uh, we've got a core group of organizations that have already chosen to endorse the framework, which we hope will then encourage others to give it consideration 
consideration as we launch and continue to move forward. But we're grateful to those organizations for their endorsement, and we hope that you will continue to give it consideration as we continue to move forward. So let's talk about what it means then if you, if you decide, okay, our company, whether we're a retailer or a food processor or a developer, we decide that we would like to participate in the framework. It is open to any corporation, business, academic, or governmental organization that utilizes gene editing and or its outputs. And we were very intentional about saying you use gene editing or the outputs of gene editing, which includes seeds and plants and animals and food. Uh, in commercial research, development, or manufacturing of food and agricultural products. If you are involved in any of those activities, you're qualified to apply. And so we want to make sure that everyone who's involved in either using gene editing or the outputs of gene editing understands that the framework is available to them. Coalition members gain access to resources to assist in implementing the framework. Uh, you begin the process by completing a self-assessment, and then you apply for verification. Uh, verification is good for three years, so you complete the self-assessment initially. Within 12 months, you apply for verification. Once you are verified, you then self-assess for the next three-year cycle, and then you're verified again independently. So an organization that applies and decides to join is required to complete verification within 12 months of initial membership. Now, why the 12-month period? We want to make sure that organizations that choose to participate have an adequate amount of time to understand the framework, to understand the principles and commitments, to complete the self-assessment so that they are well prepared to successfully complete verification. So there is a 12-month window for organizations to participate who choose to participate to actually achieve verification. So again, the verification body, which is a separate entity from CFI, CFI cannot be the program, operate the program and oversee verification. So we've contracted with a third party to do verification. And so framework participants will pay the verification costs estimated to be between $500 and $2,000. Why the variance? All of the verification activities are paperwork activities. There aren't any on-site audits. There's no necessary on-site visit. But if I'm a relatively small developer and I have a few uh, products that I'm bringing to market, the verification is going to be somewhat limited. If I'm a large multinational company and I have a lot of products in my portfolio or a lot of different activities that's taking place, there's going to be more to review. And so the verification costs will vary simply based on the size of the entity that is seeking verification. So again, self-verification annually, re-verification every three years. So $1,000 a year to participate, re-verification every three years. Verification costs are estimated to be between $500 and $2,000 uh, based on information from our verification partner. So as I mentioned before, the, the, the Framework Oversight Committee approved the framework in December of 2020. And in December, and then in 2021, we spent most of our time working on detailing verification. Uh, because we heard very clearly from organizations and individuals that if we are interested, we have to know what constitutes verification before we can make an informed choice about whether or not to participate in the framework and whether or not to achieve or, or, participate or work to securing verification. So we spent quite a bit of time putting together that step-by-step -step guide to achieving verification. All of these materials are available on our website. Uh, geneediting.foodintegrity.org. We'll talk about that more in a minute. There's the self-assessment tool where you can go through within your own organization and understand how you want to do that. There's a verification checklist, which helps you prepare. Uh, we'll do framework participant training webinars. There's also a dispute resolution process procedure. So if you believe that you actually should have achieved verification and the verifier doesn't align with your perception of the objective evidence uh, produced, there's a procedure for reducing that, and then a recognition policy. So the recognition policy will be a formal recognition from the Center for Food Integrity that your organization or an organization has successfully completed verification and is now operating in conformance with the framework for the responsible use of gene editing. That material can be used on your website. It can be used in marketing. It cannot be used on product labeling. This is not intended to be a product labeling effort, but really to provide uh, assurance within the food system that those who are operating in conformance can use the information, can use that, that verification as a way to provide assurance to their customers and others uh, that they are using gene editing in conformance with the framework for responsible use. 
So why achieve verification? Well, we all know today, more than ever, consumers expect safe, healthy food produced in a socially responsible way. And by operating in conformance with the framework, developers and organizations can do their part to build consumers' trust in gene editing technology, working through our food system partners who are the connecting point with consumers. It's increasingly important for developers to achieve third-party verification, to show they're using gene editing responsibly as food manufacturers, processors, and retailers work to, assure, to work to assure consumers that gene edited foods are nutritious and safe for their families. We've also developed some other resources, uh, gene editing engaged in the conversation. We were so very fortunate, uh, more than a dozen different organizations, both public and private, uh, shared their consumer research with CFI. We brought together a group of, of experienced communicators in agriculture and biotechnology who then synthesized all of that information into a guide and how to have a more effective conversation around the, around the technology. And there are lots of resources available for that. If you're interested in more resource around that, let us know, but that guide is also available uh, on the website. There are also resources available to communicate about the framework. Uh, the news release, which went out earlier, uh, frequently asked questions. There are a number of those, some of which we'll address today. Others you may want to go to the website to address. Uh, flyers that help promote it, as well as flyers you can use to share with your, your uh, colleagues and others. Brand guidelines that clearly articulate how you should use and talk about uh, the framework for responsible use. And so those guidelines are there. Again, how to engage in the conversation, that discussion guide is available. And all those resources can be found at geneediting.foodintegrity.org. They are live now and uh, open for your use. And you can learn more, again, at the website, geneediting.foodintegrity.org. So before we open it up for questions, and please feel free to go ahead and start putting your questions into the chat. I'd like to invite David Fikes to offer a few words. We're indebted to FMI for allowing us to use their conference room and for participating in the framework since day one. So David, thank you for that and uh, look forward to hearing your perspective. Hey, thank you so much, Charlie, and thank you for that presentation. Uh, but also more importantly, thank you for all the work that you uh, and your colleagues I have done in terms of bringing this to fruition. Um, you know, I have been involved in it from the get go. Um, and I will say that uh, part of the mission mantra at FMI, uh, as we look at what do we want to be providing for our members, uh, is we've come up with three words, and the three words are advocate, educate, and collaborate. And so we try to look at everything that we do and run it through those lenses to say, does it you know, fit this mission? Does it fit our need to provide this for our members? Uh, and when I looked at uh, participating in the responsible use of gene editing framework, when we looked at that and I ran it through those lenses, I had not seen anything that embraced all three facets of that uh, as deeply as I think that the responsible use of gene editing did, because it promoted better understanding of a new technology. It provided uh, solid and reputable information. Uh, and it also urged connections. And that was very critical uh, in this day and age. Uh, as we look at the food chain, we've got to quit thinking in terms of links in the food chain and start to see uh, how it's more of a rope uh, and it's more of an intertwined uh, activity that manufacturers, that farmers, that retailers all have a hand and a stake in what uh, each of us is doing. Now, I've worked in the communications department at FMI when we went through uh, GMO and GMO labeling and such. And so I bear some of the scars of, of, that, of those interactions uh, and trying to get that to uh, some sense of uh, a workable uh, mode of letting consumers know uh, about their food. And what I often found and what I often heard from uh, many of the retailers is that they were getting asked questions by their consumers that they simply did not have the answers to. They did not know. When they were being asked, you know, how many products in the store, you know, have contained GMO, they did know the answers to that. And so I really wanted to work hard at making sure that FMI members have the information they need uh, to answer questions whenever the consumer ants asks those uh, and that they have reputable information, they have solid information and, a, and information that communicates uh, to the consumer. Uh, so that when they get to ask questions about this new technology, which is very different than GMO, um, 
but there's a lot of education that's got to be done uh, in helping consumers understand the difference between gene editing and gene modification. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that our members, both on the manufacturing end or in com communication with their retailer partners, uh, so that the retailers have the answers that they need to help the consumer feel as comfortable as possible about the uh, purchase of uh, gene edited food products. Um, also to be able to provide them the information that if they wanted to seek alternatives, to know what those alternatives might look like uh, and be like. We are fond uh, at FMI of saying in a technical age, in a digital age, where communication and information is the featured commodity, is the system of exchange, that retailers and manufacturers don't just make and sell food, they also have to be in the marketplace of information about how that food is produced. We can't just market the food. We've got to be able to talk uh, with a degree of authority about how that food is produced in order to satisfy the consumer longing for that information. And so I found the responsible use of gene editing to be a great format through which uh, can Consumers can have their questions answered by the retailers, by the manufacturers, because everyone in the food chain has shared information with each other, and we can all stand in support of one another in authority, um, uh, as authorities uh, in regarding the use of gene editing, both from the beginnings of it, about why it was chosen as a format to use, why this technology was engaged in the first place, and more importantly, what is the benefit to the consumer? And, you know, what are they getting out of uh, being able to purchase gene edited food? And so we've been involved in this from the very beginning. Again, appreciate all the work that has gone into this from all the different entities. Uh, and I will say that uh, it wasn't the most efficient uh, approach, but it was, I think, the most thorough and uh, relevant approach uh, because we listened to each other, we heard from each other, we argued with each other, uh, and we respectfully disagreed at points, but we always worked toward what is that way in which we can say this, that everyone can live with this, uh, this approach. And so I think that it is a thorough and uh, well uh, edited piece of, uh, of work. And so we are very glad uh, to be part of this and very glad to be part of an endorsing uh, community uh, that puts this out into the marketplace now as a way of helping to uh, advocate, educate, and collaborate together in terms of helping the consumer accept uh, and feel good about gene edited food products. So thank you, Charlie, for this opportunity to share my views. Great, David, appreciate that very much. And we do have some questions coming in. Uh, Keely, if you'd be so kind to go ahead and drop the survey link into the chat function. Uh, those of you who are interested can complete the survey in terms of being able to provide some feedback as well as your interest in, in learning more and perhaps participating. Interesting question. Uh, can you provide a little more information about the framework responsible juice editing and uh, the clarity between uh, GMO and gene editing? So great question, Kim. Thank you for, for sending that in. So um, gene editing is essentially a tool and it can be used to accomplish a lot of different, act, uh, a lot of different objectives, most of which are non-transgenic. So uh, the tool can be used in many different ways, but most of the applications that, that people are applying today in the food system are non-transgenic, which would qualify then as being non-GMO in the, in, the, in the popular vernacular. So it's more of a, of a distinction rather than a technical definition, but the gene editing is, is a series of technologies that can be used to turn on or turn off a specific gene uh, and really for some remarkable results. Uh, you know, there are, there are gene edited microbes that will reduce, if not eliminate the need for supplemental fertilizer, uh, gene edited food uh, that allows us to highlight more nutritional products and, and reduce the likelihood of allergenicity, uh, gene edited plants that are resistant to disease in areas where their options for controlling disease or pests are quite limited. So it really is phenomenal in terms of what the potential can be and is today. Uh, across the range of applications, but it really is designed for um, non-transgenic applications because once you go to a transgenic application, then you fall into the GMO category and there's a solid regulatory framework that exists for that. Uh, we have another question that has come in. Do we still have no genetically modified seeds of grains, corns, et cetera, in the US? 
Uh, no, there are plenty of genetically modified uh, grain seeds and seed that is being used across the U.S. and other parts of the world. So that is uh, a question that I can answer definitively is that there are uh, genetically modified grains and crops that are being sold and grown uh, across the U.S. and across other parts of the world as well. Other questions, comments, thoughts that anyone would like to share? Again, the uh, the survey is in the chat box from Keeley, so you can look for Keeley's name and then click on the link if you are so inclined. But we have plenty of time for another question or two or three, uh, if anybody has an additional question that they would like to uh, have addressed. All right, if not, we thank you very much for the time you've invested today. And thank you so much to those who participated, provided feedback, uh, share their intellectual or financial resources to help bring this to where it is today. We're excited for the launch. We're excited about where we go from here. Uh, the framework is committed to continuous improvement. Uh, six months after the first organization is verified, we will open it again for feedback and go through a similar process that we did uh, when the first draft was circulated to solicit feedback and potential changes as we wanna focus on continuous improvement and meeting the needs of a broad group of stakeholders. As David said, it's a process that's not terribly efficient, uh, but it does lend more credibility because we have more voices that are involved in the conversation. So thanks again to everybody for your participation today. If you have other questions or you need more information, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Go to the website, geneediting.foodintegrity.org. You can reach out to my colleague, Keely Coppice, and we'll be happy to get back to you as soon as we can. Thanks again, have a great rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>